Welcome to the Variato Insider, a podcast covering some of the latest trends and things to know in cybersecurity. This podcast is sponsored by Variato, which is an award-winning employee monitoring and insider threat detection software provider. To learn more about how Variato can help protect your company, check out variato.com. I'm Dr. Christine Zwakor, your host for today's segment, and we're covering the role of the dark web in remote work risks. Now, there's always been a lot of ambiguity, you know, mystery, even fear, quite honestly, around this topic for some people. Um, it's also known as the cyber sort of uh, black market cyber criminals, right, are using the dark web to traffic sensitive information, conduct illegal activities, and much more. And so this, of course, impacts organizations when things happen, like, you know, you find out that your critical data is being circulated or sold on the dark web. And the global pandemic and this rise of remote work, right, has only made matters more critical and worse in some cases because companies are struggling to deal with, you know, putting the right controls and measures in place to protect their data from these leaks to begin with. And so before we dive deeper into this topic, I'd like to welcome Michael Owens as our special guest on today's podcast. An accomplished cybersecurity professional, Michael has 25 years of experience within corporate, government, and military environments, focusing on cybersecurity, infosec program building, threat intelligence, and much more. He holds a doctorate's degree in business administration, um, global business and leadership from California Intercontinental University, and a cybersecurity certification from Harvard University. Uh, Michael is currently the business information security officer at Equifax. He's also a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, a member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta, a political partner with the Truman National Security Project, and serves as a state advisory committee or on the state advisory committee for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. So, such an amazing uh, lineup of experience and and you know certifications and accolades and everything in between, which means a ton of valuable insight and experience with us today. And so, so happy to have you here. Welcome, Michael, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I hate hearing my. Uh, my background kind of laid out like that sometimes like who is that guy like <laughs> but uh yeah i am you know i'm happy to be here to share you know some of my background experiences and things i'm finding um you know working in the diverse spaces particularly over these last year right which has been challenging for so many people uh so this opportunity to talk today is is great because i hope we can quickly get to dive into some of that and you know help the, the listeners and viewers that are out there yeah, absolutely. And I, I can um, totally relate. I feel like sometimes when you hear your, your bio and all of these like amazing things, it's like, wow, that's really me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely kudos, uh, kudos to you on that. So I know we've talked a little bit, but is there anything else you want to add or share more about your background or your experiences in general before we dive in? Uh, I would, I usually, you gave out some of my, uh, my educational background, but I am wearing my Georgia Tech pin today. Uh, so I'll give a shout out to the Yellow Jackets from Georgia Tech, which I got my, my master's degree from. And uh, I'm, I'm a product of an HBCU. I graduated from my undergraduate degree in computer and electronic technology from North Carolina a State University. So go Aggies. Love it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, once again, very pleased to have you as a part of this discussion. Um, let's maybe start by demystifying even what, what, is, what does the dark web mean or what does it mean to you? Yeah, thank you. It's a, a great question. And demystifying is probably the best term to use for that, uh, considering that it gets talked about a lot. You hear about it on TV and the news, but uh, what does it really mean? And um, it, it's really pretty simple. I, when I'm breaking it in terms of, let's call it the visible web, uh, the deep web, and then the dark web. I think there's three different areas to really talk about. So, you know, we talk about just a regular internet. These are sites that, uh, that are regular out there for browser, whatever browser you use, whether it's Chrome or um, Bing or whatever, that you could access. You type in a URL or an IP address and you can go to those sites. Um, outside of that, 
the vast majority of what constitutes the internet uh, is what's called the deep web. And this is anything that is not uh, indexed by the major Googles of the internet, right? So um, if they're not being indexed, that is the deep web. That could be things, um, anything that sits behind a paywall, any websites are out there and, or pages that have um, are, are blocked by specific um, membership login, anything that sits behind a login, anything that's not indexed, uh, any type of uh, blogs or anything that are out there that are not consumable just by going to the URL, all those things are considered a deep web. So, you know, you can imagine uh, there's vast untold amounts of information and pages that exist within the deep web. And then there is the dark web. And the dark web or dark net is a section or a component of the deep web, which means first of all, it's not accessible via uh, and or not indexed, right? So you're not gonna find it on Google or Yahoo on any type of, uh, of, of um, indexing that is out there or you know, any of the search engines. Uh, however, it differs from just regular information that's on the deep web in that it actually is encrypted. And then you have to actually access it uh, by a specialized browser. You know, most common one is Tor, right? T-O-R. Uh, so it's basically a smaller subset of the deep web uh, where, you know, different types of information is out there. I mean, I'm not going to say it's all nefarious because it isn't, uh, but I don't think there's, I, would, I wouldn't be honest if I said that, you know, the majority of, of it out there is probably, you know, illicit in nature. We'll talk about that in a bit, but just to set the context, right? I mean, I, I try to view it in three big buckets of what the internet is. That, that part of the internet, which is visible, uh, which we go to every day, all, all of our news sites or sports sites, you know, um, all that type of stuff. And then there's the dark web uh, or the deep web, I'm sorry, where you could imagine um, customer information may be, emergency medical, or medical records may be, uh, specifics about, you know, company information sitting behind uh, firewalls and, and, and uh, user logins could be. And then there is the, the dark web where um, it's not indexed and it is accessed only by certain types of encrypted browsers and the data there is encrypted. So, you know, the, the technology behind it, I dig a loop, little bit into the, to the techie part of it. Um, it is by nature built to be uh, obscure, is built to be um, hidden. The key to the dark web is that it's anonymous. Therefore, when we talk about types of information that exists out there, um, hide behind the fact that the deep web itself is meant to be nothing more than um, a series of links that you have to go through, which uh, are proxy servers that basically um, help to anonymize the actual person that's out there. I think, um, interestingly enough, the, the dark web itself can be traced back to the US military. Um, you know, the US military, you know, looking at Tor network um, and the, the beginnings of it uh, was developed back in the mid 90s by mathematicians and scientists at the US Naval Research uh, Facility that wanted a way to protect US intelligence. So, you know, what, what has turned out to, to be, um, you know, potentially still using those, those ways. And again, we could talk about this in a bit, but, you know, everything that goes on in the dark web or the dark net isn't nefarious, isn't criminal activity. Um, there is some positive uses for it as well. Awesome. Thanks for the uh, very digestible rundown. I like the that you put into the three different buckets because that makes it super clear for people. So expanding on that, what threats does the dark web impose on businesses and how has that evolved, if at all, in your opinion, as more people work remotely? Sure. So um, who was a lot in that question? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, what does it pose to business? Well, I think the first thing is clear um, is that there is um, information about uh, employee or about company secrets, you know, um, whether it's the secret sauce of Coca-Cola or, um, you know, whether it's just um, sales records, uh, it could be um, customer files, it could be all types of information, again, that exists out in this part of the, the internet to where, um, it's untrackable, it's untraceable. And the, the illicit part we talked about earlier is the fact that uh, people use this company information to buy, sell, and trade off of. 
Um, and, I, and you know, we're not going to get into like the, the mechanics of that. But the bottom line is, is a risk for businesses because any information is out there that's stolen now. And, and we know that, you know, millions and millions of, upon records have been stolen. Billions of records have been stolen. Uh, at any point in time, these records could turn up on the, on the dark web uh, for sale or for trade. We know it happens. It happens very often. And the more and more breaches that occur, whatever reasons they occur and data exfiltration from different companies, uh, the vast majority of this information finds its way onto the dark web where then your company could be susceptible to uh, various different types of attack or attacks on, their on your customers um, or identity theft type activities that could occur, um, you know, making it even more dangerous the second time around because now you think it's kind of like the keys to the castle, you know, someone's already broke in, they've stolen your stuff and now they're selling your wares without you knowing about it. So uh, this type of information makes it very dangerous uh, for businesses, again, to have their information out there uh, where they may not even know it's available for sale. And, um, you know, how has it, how's it kind of um, changed or, you know, with the, um, with the world moving, I guess, because of COVID to remote world, I simply say that it's um, really on the front end is where we see the biggest impact, which is with everyone working remotely now, a lot of companies have struggled to kind of get their arms around all the remote workers that are now working at home. Um, it's much easier to kind of, you know, control and protect what you have or your crown jewels, if you will, if everyone's, you know, uh, on the inside of the moat behind the castle walls, it's easy to kind of easier to contain that. Uh, you know, but you take all the village people and you put them out there in the village again, and they're not not protected. Um, it basically means that there's a lot more endpoints that are out there that are not as protected as before, which means um, many more threat vectors are out there for attackers to be able to gain access to company information that could then take that information back to the dark web to again put it back out there for sale or for trade. Yeah, absolutely. And you you touched on this idea of you know having your you know village or your people you know behind the moats or, or or within this kind of protected perimeter to now releasing them out into the the village. And I think that's a, that's a good segue into the topic of sort of insider threat. Like, what specific role, if any, do you think insider threats play in the implications or the consequences of the dark web and its use in enterprises? Sure. So. Um... Insider threat, I think, has evolved in a bit over the years um, from just kind of being disgruntled employees, I think is what we've usually thought about that, uh, to now where um, a lot of insider threat is not malicious at all. It is, um, you know, through social engineering and people being traded and, you know, to use kind of a, another analogy is that um, if, I can, if I can trick you into giving me the keys to the castle, I no longer have to storm the drawbridge, right? I no longer have to bust down the walls. Um, if you can just kind of give me the key and I can roll the moat door down and then we're all in. And, and that is what's happening with Insider Threat uh, is that so much of it is, is not malicious anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's, I've been directly involved in helping to set up internal uh, threat, heuristic, behavioral analysis type uh, cybersecurity programs. Um, to be able to tell if, um, you know, if someone is not necessarily acting in a nefarious way or they could be disgruntled employees, it could be, you know, mainly employees who are giving away this information without knowing it, um, or it could be, which, which is probably the most novel one now, um, you know, kind of more the, the, the spy thriller type series is that you have people that are being compromised, right, that are literally being blackmailed, um, you know, that type of insider threat to where their own was being used as an asset. And all of that has tied directly back to the dark web, uh, whether it is the fact that um, they're using this information uh, or they have this information that's being available on the dark web that uh, an attacker would be attacker would buy. You know, now they have information about, you know, specific sensitive information about your employees that they can then use to launch um, specific social engineering attacks that is obviously one way. Um, the other way is that they could um, use them through phishing attacks, you know, same type of information that they may gather, but use a spear phishing attack to be able to garner certain information of them. And then the last one, um, which I mentioned before, uh, is about kind of turning an asset, you know, or, or reaching out to someone and blackmailing them uh, because of specific information they may have found about an employee that may even have nothing to do with the employer 
but because they may have found some information about out about uh, a particular executive at a company, unless you being very hypothetical about the scenario. But I want to put it out there so people understand. Um, you know, if there is certain information swirling around on the dark web about a particular executive at a company, uh, that information could then be, be be purchased by an attacker, and then that executive could be uh, approached directly. Let's say, for instance. Um, and then coerced into or blackmailed into turning over, you know, intellectual property of a company so that they're not extorted or certain information they may have found from the dark web has gotten exposed. So, um, you know, there's there's multiple different ways that you know corporations have to be careful and cognizant of what's going on on the dark web and what's out there because there are specific implications. And now I think we're also starting to see even ransomware starting to turn itself into an insider threat type activity where um, certain information is being held, being ransomed. And if certain IP or company secrets are you know, handed over, they'll go back and they will uh, decrypt the information that's been encrypted by the ransomware attack. So um, just a couple, there may be more out there, but you know, just some good concrete type examples of, of what could happen and why this uh, you know, insider threat could be impl implicated directly by what's happening on the dark web. Yeah, and that's a good point. I think uh, just to, to touch on the last one on ransomware, a lot of people tend to look at ransomware as like some people are just asking for Bitcoin and, and all of that. But this play right. on asking for you know IP in exchange or asking for sensitive information um, is um, definitely an, an, an interesting angle. So we've talked a lot about some of the, the challenges and the implications, right? But what can companies do about it? How can companies respond and reduce the impacts of this growing uh, risk around the dark web and their organizations. Yeah, so the um, first thing I'd say is um, if you don't have a strong culture within your organization around security, start building it now. Um, you know, culture is, is really the very first thing that I like to dive into um, in assessing kind of what what the security culture looks like. I mean, and, and basically by that, I mean how people judge their their level of responsibility when it comes to securing your organization and their assets, right? Um, you know, I think, still think far too many companies look at security as, you know, is IT's problem or, or enterprise risk or just the, you know, global security department's problem. Um, but really, I like, it's everyone's problem, right? And, and that's really worth the focus on, first and foremost, just to understand that it's a good, building a good culture. And then secondly is cyber hygiene. You know, are you doing the basics, the X's and O's, the blocking and tackling, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, you know that includes patching. That includes ensuring that you have policies that you not only have documented, but people are actually adhering to. Um, you know, password rotations, all those type of you know, I think bread and butter uh, type things. From there, I think you know, in, in and it ties into a previous question, but you know, dealing with remote workforce and makes me think about uh, DLP solutions, right, and data loss prevention, ensuring that you have solid protections in place to ensure that, um, you know, uh, it's kind of a direct and then indirect. So directly want to make sure that people are doing the things they need to do, that we're making sure that, uh, you know, we're preventing all of the attacks that could possibly happen. Second thing is, if there is an attack that is successful, how, what do we do to ensure that it's not as impactful as it potentially could be? I mentioned DLP, right? So um, both from a from a social engineering aspect inside a threat as well as external um, having a good DLP solution in place you know making sure that you know you um, are at least able to monitor and or block um, printer ports you know thumb drive USB connections all those type of things where someone may exfiltrate data from off of your server or off of your de desktop or tablet so I think that's a, a very important thing that uh, we have to do segregation of duties um, as well as segregation within the uh, your computing environment making sure you're separating your development environment from your from your you know QA to, from your production environment uh, so that way when again when you know attackers you know we've got to play this from a standpoint that once they get in right it's not a matter of of if anymore we're looking at when they do so when they do we're looking at you know mitigating that as much as possible ensuring that again going back touching on our social i'm sorry our social engineering aspect that you know if you target an analyst they only have access to gain what an analyst can access if you target you know a a, a c level executive 
they probably shouldn't have access to your GitHub repository. So that's still gonna be safe. Um, however, if you don't have those type of segregations in place and you know you just have an environment where everyone has access to everything, uh, that is going to be a really you know serious problem to have. So you know the I know I'm talking about a lot of issues that don't directly relate to the dark web, but what our goal should be is to ensure that we stop things from getting on the dark web to begin with. If we can do that, we we've, we've met vast majority of the challenges there. Once your information is on the dark web, um, you know. I implore a lot of companies out there to either use a, use a service or you know have an internal red team or someone that's actively on the dark web looking for you know your URLs for your um, C level employees for looking at you know anything that would tie back to your organization because the better off you know about what's out there the better off you can protect yourself about you know immediate threats that are there. Yeah, absolutely. Such a, a good coverage and lineup of different recommendations, everything from culture, which is, again, one of my favorite um, topics, because I think it's one of the most critical without culture, you none of the other items will, will work, no matter how hard you try. Um, but yeah, taking that layered approach and um, covering all of that ground is super important. As we wrap up, are there any final thoughts that you want to add? I mean, I think, uh... I'll just mention something that you and I chatted about early, which was, um, you know, just to stay vigilant because, you know, the, the, the attack landscapes are always changing. Um, the threat vectors are constantly multiplying. And I think um, it's, a, it's a constant effort to ensure that what we're doing in the information security space um, is protecting, you know, key data and people's information and, and our corporate assets. Uh, and, you know, and we're charged with that. I think, you know, touching back on culture again, can't be understated. So I'm happy you brought that up. Um, and, but we have to follow it up with direct action. So um, again, you know, I just, I just want to make sure that everyone takes the time to understand that security is everyone's issue. The, the dark web is a scary place, um, but it is, it's real. It's not some nebulous mystical thing. It, it's it's kind of like the cloud, right? It's, it's someone else's servers somewhere else. So um, it, it's still a real thing. We can still protect information. Um, nothing's going to find its way onto the into the dark web magically, right? I mean, there's a vulnerability, there's a hole, there's a gap that's somewhere that's being exploited that's going to allow that information to get out there. So you know, the the more vigilant we are on the front end and having defense and layers and doing the things that we need to do, uh, we can stop information from getting out there on the dark web. And I think the last thing I'll say, just to, to turn. Uh, the patient is a little bit because I mentioned this at the beginning is that everything on the dark web is not completely doom and gloom. Um, you know, we can speak about this specifically from a US perspective, uh, but there's plenty of places around the world where uh, the internet is not as available and free as it is here in the US. Um, and some people have had to use the dark web uh, and the an, an, uh, anomaly that it possesses to be able to um, assemble to be able to, you know, talk about human rights and uh, to, you know, I explore different atrocities that may be going on in different parts of the world. So sometimes in certain areas where they don't have necessary freedoms, uh, the dark web can be a place where the, the um, information can be used for good and is necessary because certain regimes or certain areas will not allow them to use the internet for a lot of things that we use it for, you know, good in the overall good every day. So, um, you know, I want to make it, you know, clear that the dark web isn't, isn't all doom and gloom. Uh, there is some positive reasons for it. And again, it was, you know, created by our own uh, military as a, as a place to be able to um, communicate um, with a higher level of, um, a higher level of security. So we want to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, absolutely. Really good point on the good and uh, bad or however you want to frame that up, but there's definitely, you know, two sides to, to this thing. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. Uh, that concludes the Variato Insider podcast for this week. This podcast is brought to you by Variato, which is an award-winning cybersecurity company. Their solutions are anchored around four core areas of cybersecurity protection, including employee monitoring and web filtering, insider threat detection, employee investigations, and ransomware support. So to learn more about how Variato can help protect your company, check out variato.com. Thanks, Michael, for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure being on.
course. Um, and thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. I'm Dr. Christine Zwapkor, the CEO of Cyber Pop-Up, and it has been our pleasure to share these insights with you. So until next time, stay safe and secure, insiders. Thank you.